Good evening. Thank you. And welcome tonight. Sorry for the delay. We had a little bit of technical difficulties. But we're in Psalm 115 right now. And the title of this is Preparing an Answer When Unbelievers Scoff. Uh, psalm 115 is the third psalm in what are called the Halal or Praise Psalms. And we've been talking about those from Psalm 113 uh, through 118. The parallel prophecy year would be 2015. So what happened in 2015 that lines up with what Psalm 115 talks about? Well, although this psalm talks about the uh, futility of trusting in dumb idols, the last part of it is very prophetic when it comes to Israel and what was going on uh, in 2015. Let me give you the psalm first. It says, The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. And look at that last verse. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. Well, we need to pay attention, particular attention, and notice to verse 14. What was happening in Israel in 2015? And did it relate to this verse? Well, it did. It's called Aliyah. Aliyah is Jewish immigration from countries around the world into Israel. In 2015, it was booming. So much so that a five-year plan was adopted by the uh, Jewish government in the Knesset that looked something like this. It was a five-year plan to include family commitments over the next five years, specifically for people coming in, immigrants, special needs, emergency funds, education, special events and weddings, housing, debt payments, and open employment. And so what that's talking about is that there was so much of an influx of people that they had to have some type of, some type of, uh, of gearing to the, to the massive amount of people that were coming in. 230,000 to be exact, and 215 alone had made a liar from, the, from these countries. They came from the United States, 110,000, Canada, uh, Netherlands, Belgium, France, Italy, Turkey, Germany, Austria, Sweden, South America, and excuse me, South Africa and Australia. They were coming, they were Jews that were coming back to Israel, making a liar, fulfilling that, that verse that we'll read again in a moment. Plane load after plane load were coming home, and El Al was picking them all up and bringing them into Israel. And so, in, again, let's sh show you that verse. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. The largest group returning in the year of 2015 were young marrieds with children. Get, I get chills thinking about it, 25 to 34 year olds. And so when he says he's gonna increase your children, literally that's exactly what was happening in Israel in 2015. And you can see the young marrieds even coming off the planes with their young children. So it's pretty amazing to me. Again, I get a little goosebumpy when I think about how, how powerful the scriptures are and how they align right up to those, to those years. So, and women who also could bear children, obviously. Uh, as a matter of fact, in 2015, Israel was among the top 10 nations worldwide uh, for women leaving their own countries where they were born and coming. Here's, here's a chart that shows you that. So you'll see all the way down to Poland, but you'll look at that little yellow dot over there. It's pretty hard to see on the, uh, on the map, but down in there, it's Israel. Israel is definitely down there in, in them coming home. So when we look at the uh, actual uh, Psalm 115, it perfectly and prophetically parallels with 2015. But tonight, we live in a skeptical, critical world, a world not sure of faith, a world not sure of truth and spiritual things, a world of scoffing unbelievers. Obviously, I hope you became a believer in Psalm 115 in 2015. The, the uh, statistics show it and prove it that they are paralleling those years. But there's people who scoff at things that are biblical, not just those things, but things that are biblical. So what can we say when God seems to be absent or silent or both in our lives? And what happens when in the midst of suffering and tragedy, God doesn't act according to our expectations or our plans? What do we say to people when we have assured them that God is real and that he will provide for us and then the evidence doesn't seem to back up our claims? In short, what do we have to say to scoffers? Well, this is our outline tonight, Psalm 115. It's uh, preparing an answer when unbelievers scoff. So who are you going to call, verses 1 to 8? So who are you going to trust, verses 9 to 11? So who's going to bless us, verses 12 to 15? And so who are you going to praise, verses 16 to 18? So let's start with the first part of this. Who are you going to call? Not unto us, O Lord, the psalm starts out. Not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? But our God is in heavens. He has done whatsoever he has pleased. That may mess up a couple people, but he will do whatever he wants to do. Uh, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. So as we look at that, I remember, and you probably remember too, the movie Ghostbusters. 
And uh, obviously their catchphrase was, so who are you going to call? Well, they were the only ones able to contain the ghosts of New York the movie did, a movie uh, portrayed. But this is no movie. Life is no movie. It's a real deal. And I love verse 1 of Psalm 115. Don't help us for our own sakes, Lord. Help us for your name's sake. You'll see that all over Scripture. God obviously does things for his people, but primarily, we talked about this last week, it's for his name's sake, so that people can look at what he's done for you and glorify him. God gets glory by doing something for us so that people can, get, can give him praise for it. Let me look at it in a couple other verses of Scripture. Uh, uh, let me, before I do that, let me read the rest of that first part. They have mouths talking about the idols, but they speak not. They have eyes, the, uh, the dumb idols, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses they have, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Did you notice it's the five senses? He's talking about the five senses, which is the parallel and the, is telling us the juxtaposition is telling us that God has senses. He can, he can do all those things. Idols can. They have a feet, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusts in them. That is a cutting statement, that verse one. They that make them are like unto them. They have eyes and mouths and ears and nose, but they don't hear anything. They're just, they're as dumb as their idols. That's exactly what that is saying. So uh, uh, verse one, again, I love, I love what verse one says. It's, let's go back to it. It says this, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give, give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. So in scripture, we see that everywhere. It's Jeremiah 51, 14. The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself, surely I will fill you with a population like locusts, and they will cry out with the shouts of victory over you. And then you can see it in Amos 6, 8. The Lord God has sworn by himself, the Lord God of hosts has declared, I load the arrogance of Jacob, detest his citadels, therefore I'll deliver up the city and all it contains. He's swearing by himself. Listen, Hebrews 6, 13. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. We shouldn't swear by God, but God can swear by himself. And that's, that's, probably, that's talking about his name. God's name is almost as powerful as his nature. According to scripture, his name moves mountains. It splits the tall cedars. It makes the cattle give birth. And also sends devils running and brings satanic warfare to a screeching halt. His name restores. His name heals. His name gives back life. He will not let his name be made fun of. He won't let it be trampled on or maligned against. Our own names are the sweetest sound we can ever hear. If you ever went into any type of teachings and talking about how to win friends and influence people, you'll find that. The number one thing they'll tell you about is someone's name is the most sweetest thing you can hear. One of the reasons why if you go to a restaurant and you see waitresses, they usually have their name tags. They, what, the, what, the, what the management knows is that if you call them by their name, they're going to give you better service, whether they know that or not. If you're talking to somebody and you want to remember their name, you should be able to repeat it back to them once they, ask you, once they tell your name at least eight times. Put it into your long-term memory. And when you do that and make eye contact with someone, you instantly have a friend. It's how you win friends and influence people. I remember going to a dry cleaner years ago and uh, I hadn't been there in a while. And I remember the, the man came out and he remembered my name. I was so impressed that he remembered my name uh, because he probably has seen a lot of people uh, that it made me instantly feel I'm not going to go to another dry cleaner. Uh, I never thought that before, but it was just that contact that was there. Well, this is the same thing with God. It makes, it makes instant friends when you tell them their names. Uh, people will hear their name before they ever hear anything else you may say. So does God. And God loves to hear his own name. The Bible is a book of names of God. We can go through them and show them to you. It, El is the mighty God. Elohim, multiple God, used 2,570 times in Scripture. If you have any Jewish friends, you may want to take them to Torah, to their Torah in the first book of Genesis, where God says, let us make man in our image and our likeness. He's, he's talking about a plural. That word for us there is Elohim. Who's he talking to? He's not talking to the angels. He's not going to make man in the image of, of the angels in himself. He's talking to the Trinity. Let us make man. El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God. Adonai, master or Lord, used 300 times. Always plural, by the way. Adonai is always a plural form. Jehovah, the Lord, Yahweh, used 6,823 times in Scripture. And you know some of these names. Jehovah Jireh, provision. Jehovah Rophe, healing. Jehovah Nisi, our banner. Jehovah Mekadesh, uh, sanctification. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. Jehovah Elohim, the Lord, our God. Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness, Rohi, the Lord our shepherd, Shema, the Lord is there, she Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, and El Elyon, Most High, and Abhir, which is Mighty One. It goes on, Scripture, I can spend all night on it. Kadosh, Holy One, Elroy, the Seeing One, or God, uh, excuse me, King God, Cana, the Jealous One, Pele, the Deliverer, Yesha, Savior, Gael, Redeemer, Magen, Shield, uh, 
Magan David is the shield of David. That's the star of David. Magan actually means a shield. Uh, it's a name for God in the Old Testament. Ialuth, the God of strength. Sadiq, righteous one. El Olam, and I love that one. The God of the vanishing point. You've heard me preach this probably and teach it before if you've heard me say anything. If you're an artist and you're trying to get perspective and you want to draw a train, you draw big over here, and then you put a point over here and you bring those two lines down to that point and it's a vanishing point. It means the God, El Olam is the God of the vanishing point. As far back as you can imagine, God is there. As far back in the future as you can see, God is there. El Berith, the God of the covenant. Uh, El Gibor, the mighty God. Zur, God our rock. By the way, that's used when it's talking about circumcision. Uh, it talks about when Moses wouldn't circumcise his son, uh, his wife did it, and it says that she uses the rock, Zur, uh, Atik Yomin, it's Aramaic, the Ancient of Days, Melech, King, and then the New Testament, Kyrios, Lord, Despotes, Lord, Theos, God, I Am, Tetragrammaton, Theotes, Godhead, Hupsistos, Highest, Soter, Savior, Jesus, Yeshua, obviously, Christ, Anointed One, Logos, the Word of God, Alpha and Omega, first and last. So over 7,836 times in the Old Testament and the New Testament is the word Lord used. Matter of fact, the Bible is a book of God's names. His name is used over 12,000 times in the entire scripture. So God loves his name. And if you really read your Bible, you'll start seeing the progression of God's name. They'll say he wasn't known by this to Abraham and he wasn't known by this. And he keeps giving us his names as we continue to progress in him. Him. By the time we get to Revelation, and I'm getting way off for study tonight, by the time we get to Revelation, you'll see the new name of God that nobody even knows yet. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a revelation to us of who he is. The more you know someone, the more familiar you get with them, the more you have the intimacy of their names. And that's what this book is about. In, in um, verse 2, it tells us something. Let me go back there. It says this. It says, uh, Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? So, we're talking about his names, and the heathen is telling, is asking, but where is their God? It's it, it, this is the, it's, it's scoffing of unbelievers uh, saying that yes, they are. Where is your God? They're saying it all the time. So where is their God? They say people still scoff at where God is. Where was he when Hitler came to power and killed six million Jews? Where was he when AIDS devastated Africa and went all over the world? Where was he in World War One? Where was he in World War Two? Or when famine devastated China and India? or through the COVID, that, the, through the COVID epidemic. Uh, where was he last week when you needed an answer to a prayer? Look at verse three. It says, but our God, but notice that word, but our God is in the heavens. He has done whatever he has pleased. So it's an answer to the scoffers and it may, it may hurt us to say that and we may need to, to understand that. It's a tough to swallow, but if we don't, we'll never be faithful to our God. If we don't trust him, even when we don't see him, we'll never be faithful to him. The Bible says, He's in the heavens. He has done whatever he has pleased. One of the things that I think about God is really contrary to my own nature. If I were God, I'd show myself to everybody. If I were God, as soon as somebody said something about me, I'd wipe them off. The, I'd put my thumb down and wipe them off the face of the earth. If I was God, I'd want to prove myself because human nature is to prove yourself. It's the total opposite with God. You can see Jesus in the parables. What he's done, he's say a parable and it's kind of mysterious and people have to really think. He's drawing people into himself. He's not trying to prove anything. He's trying to get people to use their faith. God's not trying, that's the statement. He's in the heavens. He has done whatever he has pleased. So there's a lot of people who question God. Why does he do this? Why does he do that? That verse right there is a verse of faith, a verse that you have to accept by faith. In verses four to eight, it says one more time, their idols, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have, but they don't see. Ears they don't hear. Noses they don't smell. Hands and, and uh, that handle not feet, but don't walk. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusts in them. Now remember the juxtaposition here. We're talking about God, our real God, and we're talking about dumb idols. And we're talking about how God's in the heavens will do whatever he wants. But the dumb idols, they can't do anything. Even though they're on earth, they can't do a thing. In the midst of God's apparent inactivity, and that's what it is, the psalmist says, okay, so what if our God seems like he is not responding? Show me how the gods of you serve respond. They don't. Truth is, there is no other God other than Jehovah. So if he's not answering, I guess we'll have to wait, is really what it is, because there's no other answer coming from any other gods. And that's what David is trying to put forward here. Verse 8 is a profound truth. We, mankind, you and I, will become like we worship. Let me repeat that. We will become like we worship. You worship empty idols, it makes empty people. You worship lust, you become lustful. You worship pride, you become prideful. You worship money, you become greedy. You worship ego, you become egotistical. You worship looks, and you become narcissistic. 
You worship God and you become godly. So this brings us to our second point. So who are you going to trust? Verses, verses uh, 10, 9 to 11 tell us, O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Magan, by the way, that word for God. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and he is their shield. A tripart message of trusting and of God being a shield. So who can we trust tonight? Well, you can trust this. That's the Dow Jones. Right now it is soaring, going back and forth a little bit. But look at the precipitous rise uh, from 1900s all the way to 1910. That's only, to, to, excuse me, 2010. And it's even further up than that. But you'll notice that there's some pretty good dips in that. Uh, there's a lot of people who trusted in the 1920s called Black Tuesday, 1929, where people died and jumped out of buildings because they lost everything. So you can trust, you can trust the Dow, but it's pretty, it's pretty stable, isn't it? Not really. Um, mortgage rates are low right now, but what about a year from now? What about if hyperinflation hits? So maybe you want to trust treasury bills. Well, they're also on a rise from since 2016, but they're also going right down in 2020, losing their interest. Treasury bills bear interest over five, 10 years, and you, you get money from those treasury bills. So this is a three-month treasury bill. It's called a secondary market, and you could trust that, but you're not getting a whole lot of interest, and even now, those interests are plummeting. So can we fully trust maybe your government and your leaders and how they spend your tax dollars? <laughs> public Total public debt versus our GDP, gross domestic product. When you go in debt, let me just give you a quick economic lesson. When you go in debt as a government, you have to have goods so you can get out of debt and so you can sell it. When your gross domestic product, when your goods drop and you're in debt, you're in trouble because you can't sell anything to get that out of that debt. And this is what's going on. Our spending is, the, is that red that you see. And then the budget deficits is, that, is, the, uh, is the other, the dotted red down on the bottom, and then the revenues are there. You can see that our budget deficit is above our revenues. Our spending is above our revenues. That's one of the reasons why America is in such trouble. Almost $27 trillion of debt right now. So you can't trust that, or maybe you can just trust our, our money. Doesn't it say in God we trust? <laughs> I actually, you know, people fought to have that in there, and I think it sounds good, but I wish it wasn't on the dollar bill, to be honest with you. And it's not because I'm an atheist. I believe in God, but I don't want to put God and money on the same plane, on the same uh, on the same page, or in the same same uh, bill, because that doesn't tell you trust in God. That tells you that that you're trusting in money. The word trust in Psalm 115 is the Hebrew word for secure, to be unconcerned. That's what it means. Things are happening around you, but you're unconcerned. Wow, it's like a hands-off attitude. Even though things are happening and God's in the heaven, my hands are off it. He's, how concerned are you so? How concerned are you for your children? Well, obviously the answer is we're very concerned. Are you concerned enough that you trust God and you can take your hands off of them no matter what's happening to them? I know it's touching people today. Some of you have children who are unsaved. You have to trust God with those people, you have to tr with those children. You have to trust God that he's gonna bring a voice to them that's not your voice. Maybe it's another voice telling them about him. How concerned are you with your finances? Now obviously we should be some concerned with all these things, but isn't it ultimately in God's hands? Shad and I were just talking yesterday about finances, weren't we, Shad? And we said about when you trust. You could trust, you could trust the government, you could trust yourself, but ultimately our trust has to be with God. How about your well-being? How about your health? How about your happiness? That the, that's uh, that's the, 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 can you trust that the dollar will be stable over the world? Of course it won't. Do you worry? Well, worry will make you, I preached once, worry will make you a coward and a cheat. It's like rocking in a rocking chair expecting to get from one room to another. You're not going to do it. And so basically what we have to do is ultimately trust God. The, look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. It says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Man, that goes totally against any survival attitude we have tonight, doesn't it? Uh, because we're trying to say, God's saying, trust me. Jesus says at one point, don't even worry about tomorrow. Sufficient is the evil of today. He's really telling us, get through the day. He's telling us, T trust your father today. And that's really what it's about. Why do you think manna only came every day and then rotted by that night? It's so that they could trust him again the next day for manna. And so it's a principle of scripture that we have to daily trust God. Man, I hope you're getting as much out of this as I am in giving it tonight. Notice the three groups mentioned here. It says, O Israel, and I have them in different colors so you can see the re repetition. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He's their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He's their help and their shield. You that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Israel, 
the house of Aaron, which were the priests at that time. Um, th those were the bridge builders to God. And then us. And the threefold promise to each group, our help and our shield is there. Literally, the one who pulls you in from any trouble or the, protect, the one that protects you by stepping in front of you. That's what a shield does. A shield steps in front of air, any arrows. So when it says he's our shield, it means no matter what's coming at you, no matter what your fear you have, trust God, your shield's going to work. If I went to war and I had a shield made of paper mache, I'm not going to trust in it. If I had a shield make at, made out of tissue paper, I'm not going to trust in it. But if I have an iron shield, I'm going to go to war. That's going to help me. The Roman army defeated the world by having shields and doing something with them. It's called a turtle. Somebody would fire down on them, arrows would fire down, and they'd get into a shell and they would look just like a turtle. And all over that entire encampment, not, no arrows would get through. And so they were able to defeat their enemies. And so that's what God is telling us here, that you, we, he is our shield. Again, the, shield word, the he, Hebrew word is magin, the one we can place all of our cares and concerns behind. Like the magan David, that's the shield of David. That's the star of David, also called the shield of David. Or I like to do this one. The cross is our shield. It shields us. So we will forever be reminded as we sing this psalm in the millennium, and by the way, you will sing it in the millennium, that we made it in and we made it to God, whether we're a Jew who's, who's accepted Christ, a priest, or a Gentile that have been saved because the Lord fought our battles. He pulled us in and protected us. But sometimes we don't see that happening in our everyday battles, do we? Uh, sometimes it feels like no, no one's helping us at all that no one's protecting and that no one's coming to our aid. I don't want to just give you promises of scripture without the reality of your life because I know that that happens. The unsaved think it's hogwash to fully trust a God we can't see. But just because we can't see him doesn't mean we can't hear him or him hear us. You see, we can hear God, but we may not be able to see him. But unlike a dumb idol, he sees us. He hears us. He feels our hurts. He walks in front of us. Man, he even walks behind us. Isaiah tells us that. The Lord will go before you. The God of Israel will be your rear guard. He's in front of us and behind us. Here's your promise tonight. Isaiah 58.5. Then, sh then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth especially, speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. Go behind thee. I call it the promise sandwich. Your righteousness will go before you, and the Lord will go be will be behind you. So, what we're talking about tonight is a promise sandwich. Righteousness and God's faithfulness goes before you. Inside is your personal restoration, maybe your health, or maybe an answer to any prayer. And then after you is the glory, God's heavenly ble heavy blessing, the re reward, re reward. So God's saying, whatever your need is, I'm gonna I'm gonna sandwich that on both sides so that you can you can rest in that in that in that answer. Let so tonight, there's your sandwich. Let's eat it up for a moment. And while you're chewing on that promise, remember the third point. So who's going to bless us? Well, Psalm again says this. The Lord has been mindful of us. He hears us. He sees us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord. The same three things. Israel, the priests, the bridge builders, and us, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more. Remember that verse? You and your children. That's not just to Israel and the Eliah, that's to us. You are blessed of the Lord which made heaven and earth. So, it's a prayer blessing. Let me reread that prayer blessing and let me just put it this way. He will, you may want to read it with me wherever you are tonight, listening to, listening to you in your, uh, in your iPhone or your laptop or wherever it is. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. You are blessed of the Lord which made heaven and earth. Now, there's a lot of replacement theology today which takes that and says it's only for the church. But I just read to you that's for Israel, it's for the priests, the bridge builders, and it's for everyone else. And so that is one that, that's for Israel and also for us. So you've heard of the prayer of Jabez. Uh, you, there's a prayer, of, uh, there's one, recently a prayer of David. There's a prayer of Paul. There's a prayer of Jesus. There's a prayer of Moses. But here's one no one put into a book yet. But it's very, very powerful. We need to pray this prayer. When you talk about your finances, or when you think about your marriage, or your health, or your jobs, or your children. Think about those things that are bothering you right now, and just listen to it one more time. He will bless them that fear the Lord. If you fear God, He is bound to bless you. That's His promise. Both small and great. You may think, well, I'm not, I don't have great faith. I'm, I have small faith. Both small and great. Whether it's great faith or small faith. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. You are blessed of the Lord, which made heaven and earth. So, let's believe this prayer with all of our hearts tonight, as we repeat it 
to ourselves, maybe as you read it to yourself, which will bring me to my fourth and last point tonight. So who are you going to praise? <laughs> Remember what I told you? The only reason how he blesses you <laughs> is so that he can get glory and he can be praised. So this is a circular thing. It's a circular position. God wants to bless you who fear him, but in blessing you, he's going to bless his name also. So watch what it says. The heavens, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead don't praise the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth forevermore. Praise the Lord. So tonight, to bless the Lord is to proclaim his glory. It's to praise his name. It's to speak of his miracles. It's to honor his word. I will bless the Lord. Look what it says. I will. We will bless the Lord. Look at that little word, will. It's an act of your will to bless the Lord. You shouldn't do it because it's something churches do. You shouldn't do it because it's rhetoric or tradition. You should bless the Lord. It's volitional. It's voluntary. You should bless the Lord because you will to bless the Lord. It's not I will as in, in the future. It's I will. I will voluntarily, volitionally bless the Lord. It's not an obligation. It's not a ritual. It's not a duty. It's praise. You know, the word praise and praised and praising and any form of praise is mentioned 250 times in Scripture. 150 of those times it's mentioned this way. Praise ye the Lord. Almost as a command. But just again, only the best commands you can ever follow are the ones you willfully follow. And that's what God's asking you to do. Notice it says, ye and he. Praise ye the Lord. It's ye and he. That's what it takes. That's how we'll pray tonight as we close. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight. I praise your name, Lord God, for everything that you have done for Mark Carell, for my family, Lord God. Every blessing you've given me in the past, every blessing you're presently giving me, and every blessing you're going to give me in the future. Lord, I'm thankful tonight that you are my bridge builder. I'm thankful tonight, Lord God, that I can praise you and bless your name. Lord, I pray that everyone that's listening tonight would realize that this is a psalm of praise to you. It's a psalm blessing you, that you are God in heaven. You can do whatever you want to do. And you choose to bless your children. You choose to bless Israel. That's your choice, Lord God, because you can do whatever you want. And in turn, Lord, we take those blessings. We know that our children are, are covered by them, Lord God. Our finances are covered. Our marriages are covered, Lord God. And in return, we praise your name, Lord. Give you glory. I pray a blessing on everyone that's listened tonight, Lord. Bless them in their, in their lives, Lord. May they continue to give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us tonight.